I still love set construction. I love set design. Alex McDowell did an amazing job designing the production of Minority Report, and he had done the Fight Club you know, prior to that and had developed, although the film wasn't made, for Mel Gibson, all the, the whole look of Fahrenheit 451 when Mel was going to remake it. And I hired him more based on those sketches. And Alex came in and built all these sets. He built all of pre-crime. His sets are extremely beautiful, very, very contemporary, very sensual with, with curves, you know, and, and, and straight lines with lots of glass and, and metallic surfaces, which I personally really like. I like when the material used in the set building technique has metallic surface because subsequently the light is reflected really beautifully. And if the set has glass, you get reflections, but also you can see through the glass what's on the other side of the glass. So you get this layering. And that's what the world of Minority Report happens to be. It's very densely layered. We looked at a lot of modern architecture. We looked at a lot of, of really contemporary into future architecture. We looked at the architects who were pushing the envelope right now. We also, really from an impetus from Stephen, the idea that pre-crime was a kind of a transparent organization, that it had nothing to hide, that there was something psychologically about the fact that there was no kind of hidden secret, and at the same time it's hiding like the biggest secret of all. Alex designed a really wonderful symbol, uh, the pre-crime badge, that when you actually see the chamber where the precogs are floating in this kind of solution, when you look at it from straight down, it is in the same shape as the precog pre symbol. And yet the public does not know what the precogs look like. The precogs were never interviewed on national television. They are the greatest kept secret in Washington, D.C. Can we see the precogs? Well, the precogs have such a powerful gift that they have to be kept in peaceful seclusion so as not to be distracted from the outside world. There's more of a mythology about them that they have represented in a statue, a kind of modern art sculpt. That, that, that's about 75 feet tall, that's just outside of the pre-crime headquarters in Washington, D.C. We had our own sculptors developing this, and we took the idea that they were coming out of the liquid, that the, the base is the shape of the tank in which they float. So we used that element, and then we, we drew them up out of that as if they had, had come risen up out of liquid. But I think that we've achieved, or the sculptors have achieved something that's very close to a piece of art in the real world. I think it's not derived really from anything except its own intent. Howard, don't cry. We, we thought of the precog chamber as being the center of pre-crime. From talking to the scientists, developed a slightly spurious kind of uh, scientific theory that, that the milk in which they're immersed helps the transmission of thoughts that they're receiving from the outside world and being held by the milk, essentially. The photon milk acts as both a nutrient supply and a liquid conductor. It enhances the images that each of them receive. And we thought that this had to be a very womb-like space. And what we imagined was a kind of acoustic chamber where the surface of the chamber reflected in some way the way that their brains would be working. Right now we're sitting in the, uh, the egg, we call it. The three precog visionaries lay on cradles inside the tub that you see in this set. The tricky thing is Stephen wanted the water that they're in to be a little thick, the temperature to be comfortable for them, and there is a scene in the movie where 5,000 gallons of water has to empty in two and a half seconds. So there's some science involved to it and we wanted to do it all practical. So it's quite a, quite a ride. The rest of the, the, the issues is just maintaining the water level, maintaining the clarity of the water for photography, maintaining the safeness of the water, the toxicity of the water, the filtering of the water, the heating of the water, all that goes into the mechanical effects department that just kind of goes unseen in movies. I missed you so much. It's okay, I'm always here. Designing for the precogs, that was actually the hardest thing in the whole movie to do for me. It started out very complicated, very high tech, and it went through maybe about 10 different designs before we settled on what finally was really right for me and for Steven was the simplicity of what they wear. Initially we started with the second skin idea and then we sort of took off from there and had to come back to it and ultimately it was really about 
simply presenting a second skin for these people that it's almost more like a embryonic kind of covering um, and selecting a fabric that really reflected in the water that was very amphibian-like. For the pre-crime cops, I kind of harken back to what I call, you know, the image of the right stuff. You know, Air Force pilots and astronauts and things like that. Um, and then just sort of interpreted it in our kind of steely gray, futuristic mode. I just thought it was important for Deborah Scott to understand that the costumes couldn't be Buck Rogers, they couldn't be Flash Gordon, they couldn't be out of things to come. You know, they had to be close to how we look at wardrobe and clothing today. When I started the film, I've kind of had, my first impulse was a, sort of an anti-design. I didn't want it to look like something that would be, you know, you'd look at in five years and think was terribly outdated. I haven't done that many science fiction projects myself, so it was a real challenge. And then you, on the other hand, you have this great opportunity to sort of do whatever you want. You know, you can make it up. You're sort of creating this whole world. You don't want it to look silly. Fire him up! In the think tank, we talked about what kind of weapons would future cops have, and, and they came up with a couple of cool weapons. And it started with our, with our work at MIT and what, what some of their students and graduate students are really developing and, and what some of our military resources are really developing which is in the line of non-lethal weapons. One weapon that the think tank came up with, which was basically a sonic gun, it creates a sonic boom, and it messes with the sound waves in the air. <laughs> you know, rendering that subject completely unconscious. There was another idea that somebody came up with for something called a sick stick, which is just like a simple baton, a police baton but instead of hitting somebody over the head with it, you just have to touch them anywhere in their body, and they, and they vomit. <laughs> so rather than having bullets being shot from guns, we do have bullets in this movie that are shot from guns, the old-fashioned weapons, but all the newfangled weapons the cops use really came from this think tank. Help yourself. The hover packs were, were also just a product of, I just love the old serials like Commando Cody, you know, and, and uh, I remember he used to run and jump and adjust a, a rather large knob on his breastplate, which allowed him to go forward or land. I think one said up and one, one arrow said down. And I thought, well, maybe the police would actually be flying around in jetpacks. At the 84 Olympics in Los Angeles, I saw uh, a jetpack land in the center of uh, the LA Coliseum at the beginning of the opening day ceremonies. And I never forgot that image and how loud it was. Our jetpacks are much quieter because they've perfected that. And there's police lights, the, the blue, red, and white flashing strobe lights on both sides of the backpack. So in a, in a sense, the cops themselves are their own police cars. And I'm placing you under arrest. <laughs> Go to sleep. Did you know that some people think Tom Cruise has healing powers? According to Tony Ortega, editor of the Scientology blog The Underground Bunker, Cruise's title within the church is Operating Thetan 6, which apparently means he has the ability to heal sprained joints, colds, sore throats, or with just a simple touch. Obviously, we can't say whether this has been confirmed or not, but I'm sure you guys can make up your own minds. To like my shirt, you can get one for yourself in the link in the description.